Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is David Schmidt, CEO of LifeWave, and welcome to this very special webinar today on vaccinations. We have our members uh, joining us and our community joining us from all over the world, I see. Uh, members joining in from the United States, Australia, Canada, uh, England, countries in Europe, Mexico. Uh, it's great to see you all here. So thank you so much for joining in. Um, I think you're gonna find this webinar today to be very informative on the subject of vaccinations. I've had quite a bit of time uh, to think about this subject, pull research on it so we can look at the facts. So this is going to uh, start out as a very neutral conversation. Uh, we're going to look at the both the pros and cons of vaccination and specifically, we're going to be talking about the COVID-19 vaccine. And first we wanna understand uh, what the problem is. And then we're going to take a look at the subject of, do you need to get vaccinated or not? Uh, many of you have already made up your mind on this subject, uh, which is fine. And I hope that this webinar is gonna provide you with some very useful information. And then for those of you that decide to go ahead with getting vaccinated, I'm going to be providing a number of recommendations on what you can do to uh, protect yourself from some of the side effects and the uh, symptoms that are associated with the vaccine. So let's go ahead and get started then. Okay, I'm gonna keep this window open this way uh, so we can go ahead and reference uh, a number of links that I've pulled up here. Okay, let's start out here. This is a uh, new YouTube style channel called Brand New Tube. And by the way, as you can see across the top of my screen, there are a tremendous number of references that we're gonna be linking to in this presentation. This presentation is being recorded. It'll be available later, um, but I might recommend that you have your, your uh, phone ready. So if you wanna take a picture of the link and then reference to it later that you can. So in any case, uh, this is a video that's available. Uh, we're not going to play it now, but what's important about this is that this video is from uh, medical doctors, scientists, practitioners from around the world that are making statements to the effect that they will uh, not be taking the COVID-19 vaccine. And they are uh, providing their reference points on this, their reasons why they believe that people should not be receiving this specific vaccine, what the problems are with it, the side effects, what we're not being told. So it's a very interesting video. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, uh, you wanna hear kind of both sides of the story, I would definitely encourage you to watch this video. Here you can see the link across the top if you wanna take a picture of that. And again, this is the uh, video that I'm referencing here. And uh, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at this. It's very interesting to hear people's perspective on this and the reasoning behind it. Okay, so that'd be the first thing. Now, next, of course, on the other side, uh, we are receiving information in the news about the efficacy of the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca vaccine. And tonight we're really gonna be focusing in on the mRNA vaccine, uh, which is produced by Pfizer and Moderna. We're not really gonna be addressing AstraZeneca. 
And the reason for that is uh, the mRNA vaccine is really the new technology that we want to take a look at and what the positives and negatives of this vaccine potentially are. Uh, this is an interesting study to take a look at uh, because it shows uh, this 94% result, but uh, just pulling this up here, this study uh, looked at 600,000 people. So that's obviously a massive population size. So at least in the short term, one of the things that we can say um, about the COVID-19 vaccine and specifically uh, about the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is that the incidence of side effects in the short term are relatively low. Now, <clears throat> I'm really referring to <clears throat> life-threatening side effects. We don't know about the long term yet, and this is going to be something that is uh, critically important for us to address. So just in terms of short-term, significantly detrimental side effects, the incidence level is extremely low. So from that perspective, on the surface of it, the mRNA vaccine looks safe. Now there are uh, side effects that are of course very, very common, uh, but they're not life-threatening. Okay, and then here again is a reference to this study. Now, let's back up for a second because we're showing two different sides to the argument. We have one group of doctors and scientists that are saying under no circumstances, take the COVID-19 vaccine. We have other information that we read in the headlines that says the vaccinations are completely safe. So. How do we come to a conclusion here based on science and based on evidence of who is correct? I'd like to take a look at the timeline because the timeline is rather interesting and it actually can provide us with some uh, clues to the answer to this question, as well as what some of, some of the underlying motives are here as far as what's going on. So if we think back to uh, when we first learned about COVID-19, January 31st, the World Health Organization declares a global health emergency. Here in the United States, the CDC, which is, uh, for those of you outside the US, that the Center for Disease Control indicated on February 25th that now COVID is head heading to a pandemic status. So as late as the end of February, COVID was still not considered to be a pandemic. And that was interesting because uh, at that point last year, LifeWay was still planning to hold its international conference in Germany in the middle of March. And we were still making plans to go ahead with that. I remember that timeline very, very well. Interestingly enough, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States authorized the use of hydroxychloroquine on March 30th for the purpose of treating a novel coronavirus and COVID-19 symptoms. But yet on June 15th, the FDA retracted that usage. And we see here in the links, that we have a reference uh, to the COVID-19 timeline. So if you wanna go through this in any detail, you can do that. Okay. Now, what about the development of the vaccine and what was happening behind the scenes? Well, on January 11th, and why is that date important? Because this is uh, several weeks prior to World Health Organization declaring that this is an emergency. Uh, Chinese government shares the genetic sequence for novel coronavirus. So scientists can begin to 
uh, evaluate this. And by the way, this link is going to be available on this press release having uh, from Moderna, who of course was one of the companies like Pfizer that developed an mRNA vaccine. Two days later on January 13th, uh, you can read this for yourselves, but they were uh, developing the final sequencing already for the vaccine. This is truly extraordinary. And you can see by uh, February 7th, the first clinical batch of this uh, vaccine was ready to undergo testing and it was shipped on February 24th to National Institute of Health in the United States. And this was for the purpose of starting clinical studies. Now, I find this interesting from the perspective that vaccine development began well before a pandemic was declared and before there was even a health emergency declared. Now, this could be standard protocol in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not going to pretend uh, to be an expert on drug development, but I do find that um, the timeline is of interest. The other thing, of course, that's of interest, and we're going to get to this in a little bit, is the speed of the development. Traditionally, it's between 10 and 20 years to develop a vaccine. So the thought that a vaccine could be developed in a matter of just a few weeks and move to clinical testing uh, is either shocking or extraordinary, depending on how you look at it. So you can see right here, by March 16th, Moderna announced that the first participant had already received the mRNA vaccine. So essentially two months after they started working on developing a vaccine, they had the vaccine into the first patient. So we should probably take a little bit of look at what exactly is a mRNA vaccine. We're all familiar with, uh, with vaccines. There's going to be a link here, again, that you can look at. This is uh, from the Center for Disease Control, CDC. So this is certainly a reliable source of information. Okay, let's, let's see if we can understand this. Uh, for a little bit. First of all, the way that a virus is going to invade a, a cell is by binding with that cell through spike proteins. And if you were to take a look at a virus, there's actually these things that look like spikes that can attach to and invade a cell. And what's significant here is that these proteins that are found in uh, viruses are unique to those viruses. They're not proteins that are found in the human body. So the goal of the mRNA vaccine is relatively interesting in that if the uh, human body can produce this foreign protein and condition the immune system to recognizing this protein, then that's gonna mean that when a person is infected with this virus, their immune system is ready to respond. And of course, we have several different layers to our immune system. We have antibodies that are, are let's say our first line of defense. Uh, you even have something called a primitive immune system. And then you have, uh, T cells, natural killer cells, uh, which are going to uh, attack a virus once a virus has entered a cell. But the idea here is that if we can uh, get the immune system to respond, uh, then the likelihood that a viral infection will lead to uh, a more serious state is minimized. So that's going to be the goal. All right, now there is a video on this subject 
and we're going to be speaking about this for a moment. And again, for reference, uh, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, it's from uh, Dr. Shane Crotty is actually in uh, San Diego. And uh, he worked on the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. And he provides a, a very lucid description of the development of the vaccine. Of course, he's pro-pharmaceutical. So uh, you have to kind of keep that in mind. There's a vested interest there. Uh, but he does a very, very good job of explaining the development and uh, the benefits of the mRNA technology. But there's a few issues here, and I do want to highlight this. First thing I think we should draw attention to, and these, by the way, are all quotes from Dr. Crotty in this video. 95% of people have immune memory to the COVID virus post-infection. This statement actually raises the question, why do we need to get vaccinated at all? In other words, once someone has been exposed to uh, the novel coronavirus, about 95% of the people tested, their immune system will remember that they had the viral infection and their immune system is ready to respond. This effectively is replacing the need for a vaccination. The other thing that would be important to bring up is that during the clinical studies of the uh, mRNA vaccines, only healthy people were tested and no one in the study group had been infected with COVID-19. So what that means is if you've previously had uh, a novel coronavirus infection, maybe you didn't have any symptoms. Uh, you don't even know that you had it. The important thing is there is no data. There's no data today to know what effect the vaccination will have on that population. So this is rather frightening when we consider that millions of people uh, are being vaccinated and we don't know what percentage of that population had been already infected with uh, the novel coronavirus and we don't know what the outcome will be for that group. And by the way, these are the time codes. So if you go to one minute, 41 seconds in that video, you'll see the statement. If you go to seven minutes and three seconds in the video, you'll see these statements. Now this one will become important later. When we're talking about if we either decide to get vaccinated or if we are forced to get vaccinated, what do we do? So we wanna understand uh, what we're up against here if uh, we're forced to get vaccinated against our will. This is an experimental drug. And um, so my personal belief is that governments should not require vaccination given that this is experimental. But in any case, um, Dr. Karate points out that the COVID-19 vaccine the mRNA is encapsulated in fat. Now, the reason why they do that is because messenger RNA typically only lasts in the body, let's say for a couple of hours. And what they found through their testing was that in order to get the mRNA to survive long enough to produce the effect that they were looking for, they had to encapsulate it in fat. This means now that the vaccine will hang around in the body for several days. That information is gonna become important to us later. So just make a mental note about that for now. At nine minutes, 52 seconds, Dr. Karate discusses how the uh, vaccination is administered. Uh, we, we know it's given into the muscle and the vaccine enters the muscle cells, but here's something critical. I have two different reference sources from two different doctors who specialize in infectious disease. You're gonna see another reference later. 
were the comments made that they do not know today what cells the mRNA vaccine enters into. So you would think that if you're going to vaccinate millions of people, you would want to know everything about that vaccine to make sure that it's safe. Uh, but today they are not sure because this is new technology, what cells the vaccine enters into. That's alarming. At 11 minutes, 30 seconds, most mRNA lasts for a few hours, but vaccine lasts for days. Okay, we covered that. 17 minutes, 40 seconds. First time in human history, a vaccine was developed in under one year. Now there's a lot of ways to take this, right? The, if this technology does in fact prove to be safe and effective, this is truly revolutionary in medical science. If we look at it from the positive side, and that means that as uh, vaccines uh, mutate, as we get uh, exposed to other vac, as we get exposed to other viruses, that the a vaccine could be developed in a matter of weeks. Clinical studies could start in two months, and ten months later, we have a vaccine at market. That's extraordinary. Uh, but if there are long-term effects that we're not aware of that are detrimental, maybe they don't show up in five or 10 years, uh, we could have vaccinated half the planet. And then we have a truly frightening prospect on our hands. Normal vaccines take 10 to 20 years to develop. Dr. Crotty does make the statement that the mRNA vaccines do not genetically modify the body. I'm not convinced of that, uh, but I'm in the camp of prove it. Uh, I don't know. What we are doing is we're, we're hijacking the machinery of the cells to manufacture a protein it doesn't normally wanna manufacture. Uh, this might be okay, or maybe it's going to create a state of long-term inflammation and make our body susceptible to autoimmune disorders. I don't think we know the answer to this. Uh, so it's, it's a point to be concerned about. All right, let's go on to uh, next reference. Again, this is found at the same uh, CDC link about this new approach to vaccines. So, Everyone acknowledges, of course, this is a totally new type of uh, vaccine. The mRNA has a lot of promise. Uh, we hope that it's gonna be safe. We hope that it's this revolutionary develop, development in medicine. Uh, no one really knows if there's long-term side effects. And if you recall, uh, in November, we were informed that this vaccine had no side effects. I can recall President Trump um, giving that address. There's not going to be any side effects. Whether you, you like Trump, you hate Trump, it, it's, it's irrelevant. Uh, we were informed that there would be no side effects. Then we learned that there were mild side effects. The fact of the matter is that when we are hearing stories that there's no side effects, there is no data. There's no data that anyone can produce whether or not there's long-term side effects. And th this is the single biggest reason to avoid vaccination. And the question is, what do you do in the meantime? And fortunately, there's lots of options. Here's another uh, reference. I promised you that I had another reference and I do. And this one comes from Dr. Carlos Malva Studo, if I didn't mispronounce his name. And uh, he's at Wexner Medical. And again, there's uh, lots of really good information here that you can read through, but let's kind of get to uh, the bottom line. Dr. Malva Studo uh, states, this is a new technology and we're still learning about it. Over time, we'll continue to track data, learn, and be able to make even more informed decisions about its use and potential effects. Well, that's really a heck of a statement 
when you're saying this is new technology, we don't know everything about it, we don't know its potential effects, yet we're going ahead and we're vaccinating millions of people. The goal here in the United States is to have 300 million people vaccinated uh, by the end of this year. So this is rather alarming that an experimental drug is going to be deployed on this type of scale. Now the Lancet is generally considered to be the uh, top medical journal in the world. And quite a bit of the clinical research that was published on the COVID-19 vaccine, whoops, wrong one there, there we go. On the COVID-19 vaccine uh, was published in The Lancet. So here's one of the studies that you can look at. And what was interesting about this study and bear in mind that this, uh, this particular study was published in August, uh, sorry, July rather, uh, July 20th of 2020. Uh, the date up here at the top is August of 2020. So this is still well a number of months before this was released. However, what was of concern in this clinical study is that the participants had to be given a uh, drug before the vaccine was administered. They were given paracetamol. And uh, so paracetamol uh, in the US, we would call it acetaminophen. So they had be, to be given a pain relieving drug to uh, obviate the pain and side effects of the vaccination. So that's something to keep in mind that the, the side effects were severe enough that a pain reliever was administered beforehand. That's not something that you hear in the news or you hear people talking about. Now, Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, of course, from the, the famous Kennedy family here in the United States, uh, he is an activist, uh, really an, an incredible person. Uh, he's taking on has taken on a number of uh, very important issues. One of them has to do with vaccines. And here he would point out a few things. Uh, I saw him in an interview with Alan Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz, a uh, very famous attorney in the United States from Harvard, I believe. And uh, what Robert Kennedy Jr. points out is first, double blind studies are not required vac for vaccines. When we have any type of drug, the LifeWave patches, uh, nutritional supplements, herbal supplements, they all have to go through double-blind placebo-controlled standards. How many times have you heard that these uh, types of clinical studies are the gold standard, yet for vaccinations, they're not required? One thing to be concerned about when we're talking about potential side effects is that the drug companies do not have any liability. This was something that was uh, passed into law under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. So effectively, uh, Pfizer and Moderna can vaccinate 300 people, and if there's any side effects, they're not gonna be held financially liable. So this is a deal that the drug companies worked out with the United States government. I pointed this out a little bit earlier that no one in the clinical studies for the mRNA vaccine had previously had COVID. So that means if you had already been infected with the novel coronavirus, there's a 95% probability that your immune system is already trained to deal with a second infection. And that's effectively the outcome we're looking for in a vaccination anyway. And we don't know what the side effects will be. We don't know what the outcome will be in people that receive the vaccine that already had uh, a COVID infection. Maybe everything is fine. The answer is we don't know. It hasn't been evaluated in a clinical study that I've seen. Um, also 
of importance is that all participants in the uh, mRNA vaccine developments were healthy adults. You can read that for yourself on the clinical studies. Now, this is important because what percentage of the population is healthy? Here in the US, at least 65% of the population is overweight or obese. So that means at least 65% of the population is not healthy. What's going to be their effect and risks? Here's, here's another thing to take issue with. Again, we're told in November of 2020, COVID vaccines are completely safe. Yet, this article that was published in the Epic Times, and here it is right here. You can see this article was published on February 11th that authorities are probing a rare blood disorder among some COVID-19 vaccine recipients. Now, in all fairness, again, in the short-term side effects, uh, those that would be life-threatening, the percentage of the total population is very, very small. And again, here, I think we're, if we're playing the odds, we're more concerned about what are the long-term side effects, but that's not the issue. The issue is we were told that the vaccine was completely safe, had no side effects. Then we were told later that there were mild side effects. Well, if the government wants us to uh, trust them, I think a little bit more honesty is required here. You can understand if people didn't know, but if we go back to that article in The Lancet that was published in July of 2020, it clearly showed that there were side effects from the mRNA vaccinations. So it's not like no one knew there weren't short-term side effects. Uh, one thing I definitely would have wanted to know if I was getting vaccinated, that one of the side effects was death. This is going to be in a very small percentage of the population, but this is information that the media should be sharing with us. And uh, people should be informed that this is a potential outcome. I understand uh, that we don't want to create a panic. We don't want to create uh, concern here where maybe it's not warranted, but people should be informed that these are potential outcomes. Okay, again, we can go back to the Center for Disease Control and we can take a look at some common side effects. And here's the link over here. Now, bear in mind uh, that these side effects are predominantly on the first vaccination. People that are receiving the second vaccination have reported that the side effects are more severe. Not life-threatening, uh, but just more intense. So that's something to keep in mind if you're making the decision to get vaccinated. Okay, so this leads us to the point now of how can we protect ourselves from the novel coronavirus in the first place? Um, back in March of 2020, I began uh, to present information through two separate webinars on what we can do to protect ourselves from COVID-19 symptoms and I'm happy to report that that information has withstood the test of time. And uh, we're gonna be talking about that. First thing to be aware of that as uh, time has unfolded, CDC has published that there's less than a 1% chance of dying from COVID. Of course, this raises so many questions. Why did we shut down the world to begin with if there's less than a 1% chance of dying. There's other things that are uh, much more severe. And in fact, not only is it less than 1%, it, it, under the age of 70, it's about 0.002%. So the group that we would really be concerned with, which is still, uh, they have a very small chance of dying from a COVID infection, are people over the age of 70. Uh, Okay, 
So this is important to know when we're when we're thinking about our risks and you know is this something that we should be concerned about? Okay, one of the recommendations that has uh, stood the test of time is supplementation with vitamin D. Multiple sources have indicated that over 80% of the people that are dying from a novel coronavirus infection have, a, have low levels of vitamin D. So one of the easy things that we can do is to supplement with vitamin D. And here's gonna be a link to one of a number of clinical studies and multiple information on the subject. This, as you can see, was just uh, published in January of this year. But in any case, uh, let's say 5,000 IUs, it would be a, a very common dose, uh, 5,000 IUs of vitamin D that you can take daily uh, with no side effects. Of course, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, I'm gonna say that up front. Any recommendations I make, you should be speaking with your medical doctor and getting their advice. But in any case, um, vitamin taking vitamin D, 5,000 IUs per day or going out in the sun for at least 15 minutes, uh, this is gonna be one way that we can drastically increase our odds of surviving a COVID-19 infection. And yet we're not really hearing this in mainstream media. We're not hearing this from our health experts and we should be. Second thing is vitamin C. Uh, one of the recommendations I made last year in addition to vitamin D was mega dosing on vitamin C, specifically getting this through IV. And this is another recommendation has, that has withstood the test of time. There was an article uh, back in December that this was a patient in Australia who had, was going through kidney failure uh, as a result of having a novel coronavirus infection. Uh, the, his uh, medical doctor had read about intravenous vitamin C, administered 50 grams, and the patient made a complete recovery. Uh, Dr. Norm Shealy, who I've spoken with, he's a medical doctor and a neurosurgeon, over the course of his 50 years in practice, would regularly give megadoses of vitamin C by intravenous and found that uh, 50 to 100 grams would completely uh, eradicate a virus. And he certainly is recommending IV vitamin C for people that are infected. And uh, this is something relatively inexpensive. Let's say it's around 200 US dollars. So at the uh, first sign of, a, uh, of COVID-19 symptoms, I would strongly recommend that you speak with your doctor about getting an IV of vitamin C. Okay, another thing that we can look at here, which is interesting, and I'm gonna come back to the timeline, it's on hydroxychloroquine. Now, I'm generally not a fan of drugs. I'd rather handle things naturally, but it's worth uh, pointing this out. So here's a reference to a clinical study. Uh, there's a number of them, a number of references. I'm just gonna show this one, um, but let's pull out some of the salient facts. And the main one that I'd focus on is that there was a good clinical outcome in almost 92% of the patients uh, within 10 days, okay? so. This was out of a population of 973. This information was available in April, 2020. So let's go back to our timeline here for just a second. The FDA authorizes use of hydroxychloroquine in treating COVID-19 on March 30th. A month later, the information comes out that hydroxychloroquine is an effective cure.
for 92% of people. FDA retracts usage June 15th. I suppose there's a number of ways that you can look at this. We're not gonna get into conspiracy theories. I'll allow you to make up your own mind, but I find that timeline suspicious. Okay, here's the one that I was the most excited about, and it has to do with copper. We have been recommending that our members use copper supplements uh, since we went into pre-launch of X39 in 2018. And this of course was to support healthy levels of copper peptide, Has no, had nothing to do with, with uh, preventing viral infections. Uh, however, in March of 2020, we began to recommend that people use copper as a supplement to help reduce the risk of a COVID-19 uh, of COVID-19 symptoms and of novel coronavirus infections. And there's a tremendous amount of information that started to come out that the novel coronavirus would die within minutes when coming in contact with copper. We in fact performed a clinical study at a hospital in the United States with medical doctors and nurses in hospitals that were coming into contact with patients with COVID-19. And what we found is that uh, when the uh, doctors and nurses took copper supplements, they would not show symptoms of COVID-19. I was delighted to see that there was a study on this that was published. And that is not the one. Here we go. This is the one. <laughs> is copper beneficial for COVID-19 patients? So there's, again, a number of studies having to do with this. I, again, I would encourage you to kind of read this on your own time, but the general conclusion is that this is a path that should be researched. In fact, I had a dialogue with a representative uh, as we were uh, attempting to get this introduced into the National Institute of Health and I was informed that they were aware of uh, potential beneficial effects of copper supplementation relative to uh, infection from novel coronavirus. So again, recommendation would be the same. 2.5 milligrams daily of copper glycinate uh, based on the approval of your healthcare practitioner as a means to reduce your risk of developing COVID-19 symptoms. Okay, now let's get into uh, the subject of how to protect against the side effects of the vaccine. And I know a lot of you that are here, uh, this is one of the things that you're concerned about is what if we're put into the position where we are forced to be vaccinated or um, what if you've already made the decision to be vaccinated and you're concerned that there could be side effects? What is it that we do? Well, first thing again, we wanna understand uh, what we're up against. And as said previously, the mRNA vaccines by, from Pfizer and Moderna are encapsulated in lipids, or in other words, they're encapsulated in fats. And there is a reference here, uh, mRNA vaccine delivery using lipid nanoparticles. Uh, so you, again, can reference that and take a look at that at your leisure. Uh, but that's important because this means that the vaccine hangs around in the body for several days as opposed to a few hours. So what are we going to do and how are we going to deal with this? Well, again, in speaking with uh, a number of uh, doctors and scientists, one reference from Dr. Sheely is that what he has uh, prescribed clinically is 50,000 IUs of vitamin D3 once a week, along with uh, K2, and a very high oral supplementation of vitamin C daily, along with IVs of vitamin C. So these are some things that you can do prior to and after being vaccinated to help support the immune system, 
produce anti, uh, antiviral effects and to produce anti-inflammatory effects. So we see the side of the immediate side effects of the vaccination have to do with a lot of swelling, inflammation, headaches. Uh, so we, we want to introduce into the body some anti, natural anti-inflammatories. So vitamin C is a good choice. There are other benefits of taking vitamin C relative to a vaccination. Now, glutathione uh, would be something else to consider. You can get an IV of glutathione, but it only lasts about one hour in the body. So it's not a good choice to get an IV. Um, I'd much rather recommend uh, that you use a source of glutathione. So in other words, uh, taking a supplement, if you were to use, uh, for those of you that consume foods that have the amino acid cysteine, such as uh, whey protein, milk, eggs, uh, they'll provide the precursor so your body can make glutathione. And the, the reason to recommend glutathione is that glutathione is neuroprotective. Oh, and by the way, sorry, I skipped over this. This was a link to a reference on Dr. Sheely's website where he can get into, where he gets into um, his protocol from that he published back here in 2009 on uh, what to do with viral infections. Here's a published article on the use of glutathione in neuroprotection. So that simply means what we've seen as one of the uh, side effects of the vaccination is that it attacks the nerves. And the easiest way that we can protect the nerves is to elevate our body's levels of glutathione. The other benefit to this, of course, is that glutathione is foundational in our immune systems. Uh, so for example, Parkinson's disease would be characterized by low levels of glutathione. And when glutathione levels go low, it leaves the, the nerves open to damage. So this might be one thing that we could do. Glutathione also is a natural anti-inflammatory. So it may be beneficial in uh, reducing some of the symptoms and side effects of the vaccination. Now, another thing I think we could consider here, this would be an incredibly interesting area of research. I'm going to mention it uh, only because I think there's validity to it, but unfortunately, the availability of ozone therapy is relatively limited. But here's the, the thought process here. First of all, we know that ozone has very powerful antiviral effects. And so using this either before or after a infection from novel coronavirus could save lives. Uh, but relative to the vaccination, uh, we were speaking before about how the mRNA vaccine is encapsulated in lipids. Uh, one of the things that ozone is uh, potentially going to do is help to deal with those lipids. Um, I can't get into more any more detail than that. So what do we do if um, we are, don't have ozone therapy available? This is not gonna be as effective as ozone therapy, but they're products that are relatively available. Uh, this one actually, uh, Homozone, was uh, in part developed by Nikola Tesla, of course, uh, one of my heroes, uh, greatest inventor of all time. And uh, this is a oral supplement which helps deliver ozone into the body. Whether or not it's gonna have any efficacy on a uh, novel coronavirus infection, we don't know, although we do know that ozone is very effective. Hydrogen peroxide is another one. Now, oral hydrogen peroxide, there's some supplements on the market that combine aloe vera with hydrogen peroxide. This would be something if you were gonna get vaccinated or if you wanted to protect against an infection, you would start this, let's say at least two weeks 
before. There's a whole protocol to it. We won't get into it now, uh, but this is something you could do. Elevate the body's hydrogen peroxide levels. It's worth noting that your immune system, in order to attack harmful viruses, it will uh, use hydrogen peroxide. Immune cells will release these oxygen radicals. So hydrogen peroxide is water and oxygen. It's incredibly safe. Uh, that said, there's very specific ways that you would take it. So I would encourage you to take a look at that as an option. Now, another interesting area of research that I think should be considered is to take some type of supplement or get have a diet rich in the enzyme lipase. So there's different types of uh, enzymes in the body that break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And the enzyme that breaks down fats is lipase. So again, why do we uh, why are we concerned about this? Well, the vaccine is encapsulated in fats, and maybe one way to minimize or reduce the risk of side effects is to increase production of lipase in the body. And uh, fortunately, there's quite a few natural sources here, such as av avocados, kefir, kimchi, and miso. Um, you could also consider taking a, a digestive enzyme supplement that is rich in lipase. Again, there's no studies on this. I do think uh, because it's safe, it's worth considering, and it's an interesting area of research. Okay. There are an enormous number of questions. I wanna thank all of you for being here this evening. Uh, there's over 1,500 people online. Obviously, this is a subject that is of considerable interest to everyone. And uh, I wanna thank you for being here today to invest your time in learning a little bit more about your options. Um, one thing that I would say is uh, we shouldn't default to a state of fear. It's a natural human condition. We all have our concerns, but knowledge of course is power and it allows us to move out of a state of fear and start uh, working towards solutions and be solution oriented. There's always gonna be problems that come up in life, but once we examine the facts, once we look at our options, we can push that fear aside and we can take action and help ourselves and help those that we love. So I hope that this information has been useful to you. Hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you all soon on another uh, product training and on another webinar. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.